Alexandria, Egypt, 196 BCE. An artisan taps an inscription onto the stele with his chisel, doing a great service for his pharaoh. You see, his king, Ptolemy V, really needs something to court the priests. For the Ptolemaic dynasty are not Egyptians at all. They're actually Greeks. And for generations, these foreign kings have kept power over Egypt by engaging with the priests of its traditional religion. So this inscription is the Memphis Decree, exempting the priestly class from taxes and from coming to pay homage to him, a gesture the teenage king hopes will steady his throne and prevent another uprising. And the artisan describes the decree in three languages. Greek, the language of the Ptolemaic dynasty, Egyptian hieroglyphics for the priests, and Demotic for the common people. But he has no idea that part of this steely, broken and swept away by flood, will one day unlock the language of ancient Egypt. Big shout out to Factor for helping me decode what's for dinner. July 15th, 1799. Fort Julian, outside Rashid, Egypt. Nearly 2,000 years later, French military engineer Pierre-Francois Bouchard is repairing the defenses of an Arab fort, strengthening it against the Ottoman fleet that's expected to arrive within days. A year ago, the French army had invaded Egypt and attempted to set up a colony, but that increasingly looked doomed to failure. Both the Ottomans and British are mustering to attack the French, and the army has to consistently battle internal revolts. During the repair work, they find the stone seemingly used as scrap construction material in an old wall. The engineers immediately bring it to Bouchard's attention, as they're supposed to do with any artifact. Because you see, alongside the military campaign, which you can learn about in our Napoleon in Egypt series here, the French expedition also had an academic component. Over 150 so-called savants. Scientists, writers, linguists, and other academics have come along, setting up a research institute in Cairo where they study everything from local wildlife to ancient artifacts. Seeing the script on the broken stone, Bouchard immediately realizes the implications of this find. If this is the same inscription in three different languages, it could be the key to finally deciphering ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. So, he sends out a message saying he's found a curious artifact near Rosetta, the French name for Rashid. He then passed the stone to General Manot, transferring it to his tent to be cleaned and the Greek to be translated, while they dug in hopes of finding its missing pieces. But then, as the French army fought off an Ottoman landing at Abu Kir Bey, Bouchard accompanied the 1,700-pound stone to the savant's headquarters, the Egyptian Institute and it arrived just in time for Napoleon to see it before he ditched the expedition and sailed back to France. In doing so, he left the savants with a deteriorating military situation alongside a priceless but extremely heavy artifact that they had no way of getting back to France. Yet the information must be spread, especially once they determined the mysterious third language was not Syriac as originally thought, but the demotic mentioned in classical sources. At first, they tried copying it by hand, but it proved too intricate. They were stuck until a brainstorm. Instead of copying it, why don't they just smear ink on the front and then press it with paper like it was a printing press? It worked. And while the French army hauled the stone around even to battlefields, unwilling to leave it unguarded, prints of the inscription had already reached Paris, which was good because the Rosetta Stone wouldn't. In 1801, General Minot, now in charge of the expedition, signed a surrender agreement with the British and the Ottomans. And one of the provisions was that all of the artifacts retrieved during the French expedition to Egypt were now spoils of war and the personal property of King George III, especially the Rosetta Stone. In fact, the British were so pleased with its acquisition that they actually painted on the side, captured in Egypt by the British Army in 1801. A year later, when King George donated it to the British Museum, he added on the other side, presented by King George III. Now, I bet you think you know how this goes from here. They matched the Greek with the hieroglyphics and boom, ancient Egyptian deciphered, right? Well, turns out, not actually. Even matching the hieroglyphic characters with the Greek, no one could make heads or tails out of them. But that also wasn't really their fault. See, the Europeans were missing a key piece of the puzzle, and had been for 2,000 years. Europeans had been trying to figure out how to read hieroglyphics for centuries, but the only instructions on how to do so came from ancient Greek and Roman writers who insisted that they were ideographic, using pictures to indicate concepts. 
And while that was true sometimes, they could also be phonetic, indicating sounds the same way alphabetic languages do. And that misunderstanding was inherited all the way to the 1800s. Medieval Muslim researchers tried to crack the code and failed, though two did discover that some lined up with Coptic, a descendant of ancient Egyptian. Then later, when Renaissance alchemists attempted to read the texts, hoping to learn ancient spells, healing practices, and other wonders, they had even less luck. And it wasn't until 1814 that an English polymath named Thomas Young made the first real progress. Young, a medical doctor, scientist, and linguist, at first just busied himself with translating the demotic section of the Rosetta Stone. However, after a conversation with another researcher who suggested that the Ptolemies, being Greek, might have written their names phonetically in hieroglyphics, he decided to jump sections. Finding the royal names should be easy enough, he reasoned, since it had been suggested that they were always in a circle that we now know as a cartouche. And sure enough, he found the name Ptolemies. Upon further study, Young found 80 similarities between the hieroglyphic section of the stone and the demotic one. But that is where his work stalled, as he incorrectly assumed that hieroglyphics were logographic, that each symbol represented a word, like Chinese or Japanese, and that only the Greek names would have phonetic equivalents. Still, that discovery made Young's name, and soon researchers all across Europe were writing to him, including a French prodigy named Jean-Francois Champollion, who, quite annoyingly, kept asking for better quality prints of the stone's inscriptions. But to be clear, he wasn't just some irritating student. Champollion was a far more talented linguist than Young, and crucially, he spoke Coptic. Actually, he'd been working on and off on his own attempt to translate hieroglyphics, believing that they were, in fact, phonetic. However, being in France, he had to work off print copies of the stone, and he likely never even saw it in person. But he didn't just use the Rosetta Stone prints, for there were more drawings of hieroglyphic inscriptions and artifacts coming out of Egypt every year. For example, in 1815, wealthy Englishman William John Banks was touring Egypt when he fell in love with a 22-foot-tall, 6-ton obelisk and decided, man, that would just really look great in my front yard. It also had inscriptions in hieroglyphics and Greek, so he hoped it would be a second Rosetta Stone. So, he did what anyone would do, hired an Italian circus strongman to coordinate hauling it back to his estate in Dorset. The rich man, they're just like us. Meanwhile, Champollion had been hammering away, using his earlier work on demotic and knowledge of Coptic to reconstruct theoretical cartouches of common Egyptian royal names. His hope was that these cartouches, should he find them in inscriptions, would gradually unlock more hieroglyphic characters. This he did while also feuding with rivals and periodically going into exile for his continued support of Napoleon. Then, when Banks sent him a print of the inscriptions on his obelisk, Champollion stopped dead. There, on the side, was his reconstruction of Cleopatra. He went into a feverish blitz of work and began to realize that Egyptian hieroglyphics were a mix of ideographic and phonetic characters. And it was 1822 when it all clicked. He read the name Thutmose from an imported inscription, then checked it against the Rosetta Stone. He then bolted from his desk, ran down the street to his brother's house, and supposedly screamed, <laughs> I've got it! before collapsing in a dramatic faint. Young and Champollion would war over credit for the rest of their lives, with Young claiming that Champollion did not acknowledge his work, while Champollion said that the methodical Young had merely recognized similar characters without reading them. Both went on to withhold research from the other, and in the polarized environment of post-Napoleonic Europe, who a researcher supported was heavily influenced by patriotism. But Champollion's system, despite what some English academics claimed, worked. And in 1829, he fulfilled his lifelong dream of traveling to Egypt. Once there, he found a vanished world begin to speak to him. Using his developing dictionary and grammar system, he read the words of gods and priests off temple walls. He uncovered kings whose names had not been spoken in a millennia, and in the papyrus scrolls preserved in the arid deserts of Upper Egypt, he found the words of the common people. Even though he'd never laid eyes on it, the Rosetta Stone had unlocked Egypt.